If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. I like this year. Do you like this year? Yeah. I really, I really like it. One of the reasons I decided to come here was because, you know, I've traveled here and go there. And I've, I've generally decided to stop going to uh, as many conferences. But when I thought about Porkfest, I thought, well, this is, this, these are my people, this is my home, so I feel really comfortable. And sure enough, when I drove up, I had this sense of warmth and happiness about being here. And really, I think this year has been the best year so far. I think it's going to grow and grow from here on. And there are many things about this year that are slightly different. You notice how many more families there are here than, than the past years, right? And that's, that's a, lo a lovely thing. I look at all these kids and I think, uh, you know, parenting is hard. Parenting is, parenting is very difficult. It's, it's very difficult. It's new challenges. There's no rule book out there that shows you how to be a parent, really. <clears throat> Every kid is different. But one thing I really believe in is that children should get jobs as early as they can. I don't, I, it's, so, and you think about your own life, you know. And you tell stories of your past and your history. We often tell stories of our first jobs, right? We don't tell stories of how great algebra class was. You know? We talk about the first time. We had a job in Grungy, and your boss was a jerk, but you got paid, and it was kind of inspiring. You know, it's like your first job is the beginning of your education in many ways, <clears throat> I think. And Max Golker, who's here, you know, is horrified every time I say this. So therefore, of course, I have to say it. But I'm completely against child labor laws. Yeah. Oh, this is my kind of crowd, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they started in like 1936, and it was because FDR uh, wanted to reduce the unemployment rolls, and the way, one way you do that is by making some people unemployable. And so it worked. It's like, oh, well, we got rid of those unemployed people. We just made it illegal for them to work. Uh, strange law, strange law. Uh, and still persists to this day. So with certain exceptions, you know, FDR, um, there was this actor at the time. Uh, da -da 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 -da, good chip, lollipop, what's up? Shirley Temple, thank you. Uh, there's a, a clause in the law that made an exception for child actors because of Shirley Temple, right? She's a happy kid. Um, working is fun. Other people are exempted, like wreath makers. I don't understand that one. But to this day, it's very difficult to get a job until you're basically until you're 16. And even there, there's restrictions. You can't really be a full worker with rights until you're like 18 years old, which is a disgrace. I think kids should be working at the age of 12 or whatever. So. Uh, yeah, but when I was, when I was, and, and why? Let me just, why, why work? Well, work, well, it, it helps you understand that part of the purpose of your life is in service of others. And, and that is great because it imparts value to yourself. I mean, suddenly, if you're serving others, they like you and they value you. You value them, and you're experiencing that first great magic of the market, which is the mutually beneficial exchange, where you get gains from trade, and that's great. That's humanizing. That's that's dignified. It's it's a point of access that we uh, have towards realizing our potential as human beings. Whereas before, I mean, like in the in the classroom, like you know, the teacher says she values me, or he or she values you, probably not. You know, you're just there to check boxes and memorize things and get, get to the thing they call a grade, but that's not humanizing. That's not imparting dignity to you. Work does that. And it's also challenging. Work uh, challenges you to do things you think you can't do. Um, <clears throat> pains you hadn't felt before, long hours, uh, obeying a boss that you don't really like, uh, do, doing dirty, grungy stuff. And of course, we all exaggerate uh, the horrors of our first jobs, but we, we do it because we brag about it. We love it. <clears throat> so I think it's really important to get kids jobs as early as possible. So parents, if you do anything else, get your kid a job. Get them involved in the commercial marketplace as soon as you possibly can. If you have to lie, do it. Violate the law, do it. It's a matter of their human rights and their future. Just get them out there working. It was much easier when I was younger to work. So, you know, I, I always found jobs, even from the age of 12. You know, I was roofing and moving fences and repairing wells and I worked 
for, for an organ tuner. <clears throat> that was a blast. Um, all kind of things that I did. But then I, my first remunerative employment was really working as a, uh, as a maintenance person in a department store. But to get that job, I had to lie. You know, they said, wait a minute, are you 16? Well, I was 14. Oh, sure. They said, okay. I mean, you can't do that anymore, right? Probably ICE would come arrest you. I don't know what would happen, Department of Labor, I don't know what. I consider this a terrible violation of human rights. So, fortunately, this uh, talk isn't being recorded. So, I will tell you of a story that I had with my, uh, my own challenging son, who's actually a great man. I, I dearly love him, but... So, when he was in high school, I really wanted him to get a job. And he was, uh, didn't want to get, didn't want to get. This is what happens, you know, they're not working between like eight, uh, 12 and 16. And then they involve themselves in all these other stupid activities. Basically, they're getting themselves in trouble because they all hate school. And so by the time they're 16, it, it's almost too late. You know, it's like, uh, hey, you should get a job. It's like, what? Why should I do that? That sounds like that sucks. I don't want to do anything that sucks. This is a whole attitude. So I was trying to push him into getting a job. Then I noticed he had a problem. Weed. Now I'm a little bit of an old fashioned guy. Laugh at me if you want to, correct me. I didn't like it. I said, all right, get rid of that weed. Can't have weed around here. Then the weed reappeared. I said, all right, Nick. <clears throat> I, here's what I don't get. I'm not gonna take your weed away from you. But I don't understand, like, like when I was your age, you know, my friends and I, we all just smoke cigarettes. Like, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with you and this weed. I think it's like, what are you gonna turn into like Shaggy? For, Dad, it's not like Shaggy and Scooby-Doo, right? I said, well, I don't know why, it's the only weed smoker I've really ever known, you know, so. No, that's not bad. I said, well, why don't you just smoke cigarettes? like every normal kid. <laughs> he said, well, Dad, they're too hard to get. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you can't buy them until you're 18. I said, what the hell? Who passed that law? You know, that... I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll get you all the cigarettes you want if you give up weed. He said, okay. So I went out, and I found these really great cigarettes. I didn't want to spend a lot of money. So I found these great cigarettes. It was at some sketchy store. And uh, they were wrapped not in paper, but in cigar, in uh, tobacco paper, so they could be called cigars on cigarettes, and they were taxed at a much lower level, which sounded kind of anarchistic to me, and a little bit of Breaking Bad, so I bought them. And I brought them home to them. They were called Cheyenne. I said, look at these. I picked up this carton, which I think it was, what, 12 packs? Uh, for like $13. It was a bargain. He said, well, Dad, thanks a lot. Next day he comes back and said, Dad, you can't believe it. I sold those things for $5 a pack. <laughs> you know, this is very promising. If you could, let's say, you know, give me the money that I spent back on the cigarettes, plus an extra seven bucks, so I've got a little profit in it, I'll get you all you want. I said, well, this works. So he gave me 20 bucks. I went out and bought another cart, and he came back the next day and said, you know, I sold those too. I said, well, yo, this is great. So I went out and bought another 10 cartons for him. Those were gone before the end of the week. So I went out and bought another 20. We were both making money. He was happy for the first time in a long time. I was happy. I thought, and for me, I thought I was helping him say no to drugs, you know? Say no to drugs. And also he's selling to other kids. I thought, well, you know, I'm saving this school from drugs. <laughs> so this went on six months or so. He had booming business, making a lot of money. I'm really proud of that because he learned, you know, what it meant to make money, sell things, and he developed a real commercial ethos. He's very successful now. I'm very proud of him. And one day I got a call from the PTA. And um, they wanted to meet with me. I said, oh, brother. It's the last thing I need. So it was a winter day. I showed up in a long black coat and a black rabbit hair hat, parked in the fire lane. 
threw out my cigarette butt on the ground, walked in, and I was greeted by this woman who said, you know what, you're the most arrogant son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life. Said, you don't even know me, why would you say such a thing to me? Like, I didn't understand. So I walked in, 30 parents, all gathered, staring at me in anger. What have I walked into here? You know, I had no idea. So the head of the PTA said, well, you know, we've got a trouble with, uh, with um, contraband in our school. I said, oh, that's bad. I'll do something about that. <laughs> and another man was just boiling over in anger. He stood up and yelled at me. He said, and you know what happens to people who bring contraband into our school? They go to jail. I said, why are you looking at me? I, mean, I didn't understand. Anyway, I was kind of busy. I said, listen, yeah, all the best to you guys I took off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went about my life. The next week, Nick comes to me and says, Dad, I've got to tell you something a little bit strange. You know that meeting you went to PTA? I said, yeah. He said, well, you know what that was about? No. Well, they're upset about cigarettes. All their kids have cigarettes. And they're really mad about it. And it leaked that you were the source. So how did it leak? Well, I told somebody I was bragging about you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I said, but the problem is that it's actually kind of serious. They had a plan to put you in jail. And they involved the police. And the police came to the school, and they interviewed a number of students who told the police and had told the parents that they would name me. I said, well, Nick, this is a disaster. You don't want your father going to jail again, do you? <laughs> he goes, no, no, I, 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 it, I didn't want that, so I took care of everything. I said, well, how'd you do that? He goes, well, I paid them all off in cigarettes, so they lied. <laughs> all right, so I'm a good father. <laughs> Yeah, my daughter was another problem, right? Because uh, she went to college at 14. <clears throat> and uh, one thing you know about college is that, uh, you know, they're not the safest places. It's from, again, it was a father, you know? He was, you want your daughter to be safe in college. And one thing I know about college is they're very dangerous places for young women in dormitory rooms and fraternity houses and these rural houses with parties that are all dark. And everybody goes to these places because of the drinking laws, right? I mean, so you can't drink until you're 21. But of course, that's ridiculous. Nobody's going to do Everybody's going to be drinking. So they got to drink somewhere. So they have to drink in private. Well, I was determined to make sure she was not about to drink in private. Of course, I wanted her to drink. But not in private. I wanted her to drink in the public bars. So I made her, just as a matter of parental discipline, get a fake ID. I'm not letting her go to college without a fake ID. So that was back in the day when you could get a fake ID pretty easily on the Silk Road. So I gave her Bitcoin, explained the Silk Road to her, told her to go buy her fake ID. Uh, she did. <clears throat> it never arrived because the Silk Road website was shut down <laughs> right about that time. So her name landed in the head, hands of the feds. So that's actual true story. But anyway, I found another a route for her, so she got her fake ID and stayed safe. So good. You know, this is this is the weird things that parents have to do to keep your kids safe in this world. It's it's tragic and strange. Commerce to me is a great source of life and energy and hope for humanity, and we're surrounded by it everywhere. So much so that we uh, we very much take it for granted. My newest book is called, is called The Market Loves You. The purpose of the book is to help inspire people to love markets, uh, to understand how the markets love them and how and why they should love them back in the defense of markets. Now, you might think that the markets are not under assault. They are under assault every single day, and they've been, it's been true for about 100 years. About 100 years in this country. And they are still, from child labor laws to uh, all the taxes we face, and now we face a, a threat from the right with tariffs. Everybody seems to be against mar markets. Did you hear Tucker Carlson's uh, famous monologue, you know, came out a few months ago? He's against free markets now, too. Everybody's against free markets. 
Uh, Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump fully agree on the evils of China and why we need to have huge tariff barriers there. It's, it's all terrible. We in this room, I think, understand that markets are actually the way that we live fuller, better lives. And without them, um, it would be back to a state of, state of nature. That's the, that's the whole theme of my book. And it, it goes through all kinds of products and their history and their meaning and so on, all in the interest of inspiring a kind of love for free markets. So I would like to offer with today to you a kind of, I don't know, like, I guess a theory or an outlook. And I don't want to get too elaborate and too broad with this, but I do want to explain the last 600 years, just <laughs> briefly. So it goes like this. Every time the, something marvelous happens to the markets, it inspires some kind of reactionary force. You can call it leftist, you can call it rightist, it usually takes one of those, one of those two forms, but there's some gigantic reaction that grows against it because people, like, people love the products of markets, but not everybody's comfortable with the loss of control that the markets mean. And that's really the great debate we're facing. Do we want to live in a society of freedom where people have rights and can go around and do crazy uncontrolled things and invent products you never thought about, like Bitcoin, uh, uh, serve, serve others with, with innovation, uh, move, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, the kind of dis disruption that's associated with the markets, a lot of people don't like it. It took me so long to figure this out like decades of thinking to figure this out. That people don't like markets because they disrupt their own plans for the world. They, you know, they could, <clears throat> whatever your vision of humanity is, markets are probably gonna make a mess of it, you know? You think we should have a theocracy? Markets are gonna make a mess of that. They're gonna enable people to believe whatever they wanna believe, you know? You wanna keep your kids for, home forever? Yeah. Markets are going to draw them away into some other profession. They're going to move and it's going to make you sad as a parent. You think that <clears throat> whatever, whatever your vision of society is, markets are going to disrupt them. There have been three great periods of disruption in the Western world, anyway. And here's where David Friedman's ears are listening very carefully so he can spot my errors and he's going to object to them, everything I say afterwards. It's, it goes like this. The end of feudalism. This was a gigantic disruption because it, it caused people to move to new places, fill up the cities in ways that had never been filled up before, empty out the countrysides, and disable an old aristocratic elite. So th that, was, that was a gigantic change in history. It was the most significant change in like a thousand years. And feudalism was all, wasn't all that bad. It was probably better than just complete collapse up to the end of the room, but, and, and it had a certain stability to it, but eh, the workers and peasants didn't like it that much, and they'd rather move to the city and start working in uh, cool little factory jobs and things. That was, that was a fantastic thing. But the elites didn't like it. So what was invented to counter the end of feudalism and the rise of capitalism? It was this thing we call the nation state. It was a kind of a, a vicious technology of violence and control. The nation state was really different from the state that had preceded it. Before the nation state, we had a thing called the personal state, meaning that there was some big shot that ran everything, but if somehow he died, uh, through natural or unnatural reasons, <laughs> um, the state died with him. That was called the personal state, and that was the usual medieval model. Even going back to the classical world, that was a medieval model. The nation state was this new thing. It really, uh, uh, Louis XIV was a, uh, 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 the, the greatest specialist in this of, of all the uh, uh, big shots of his time. But it was to create a bureaucracy that had a certain immortality to it that outlasted the life of the ruler himself. So, uh, and so ever since then we've lived in these nation states, so they're not personal states, so you get rid of the head of the state, you get rid of the legislature, you get rid of the Supreme Court, the state lives on. It's like in the US nowadays, nowadays. every once in a while it's like, well, bad thing has happened, the government shut down. And you're like, ah, sounds pretty good. <clears throat> they come to find out, they're still collecting taxes, <laughs> they're still enforcing laws, and then it's like, oh well, of course we're never gonna get rid of essential functions, 
That's essential in the sense of like robbing you, you know. That's what they mean by essential. So we have this, in, this immortal being out there called the nation state that we can't seem to get rid of. That was the great first reaction to the big gigantic uh, change in the world in the late Middle Ages of the end of feudalism. That was an epic change in history and it created a reaction. Now the next great change that happened in history was uh, happened over the course of what's called the age of laissez-faire between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and World War One. That's 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 a period of the rise of capitalism where it just went crazy and completely changed the world. <clears throat> it um, it permitted um, well. I mean, you can look at the data and see that during the period. And by the way, the left is always denouncing this period for, for whatever weird reason because. It, it, it led to mass prosperity, like we had never seen before. Infant mortality collapsed. <clears throat> it was not uncommon before the 19th century for you know, three out of four kids under the age of two to die. Now suddenly it was, uh, just, it was um, just one in five. I mean, it was a dramatic transformation. Per capita income went through the roof. Uh, people experienced new kind of opportunities and the prosperity spread among all classes of society. And that inspired waves of immigration and lots of people began to get really rich who the aristocracy at the time didn't really like uh, getting rich. And that bred a gigantic counter reaction. Um, in the late 19th century and early part of the 20th century. I could never understand this, really. I, mean, I, used, to, I used to always puzzle about this. Like, we had this perfect system of, of, of commerce that was ennobling the whole of humanity, where income was becoming more widely uh, shared among, among everywhere. People were living much longer lives. Fewer children were dying in childbirth. Our medical care got better. Our cities got cleaner. Cities were invented. We had all kinds of new technologies from electricity to flight to, to the commercialization of steel. Society was dramatically changing. If you look at the charts, they're actually amazing. You can look at like a thousand year trend. I was gonna bring some PowerPoints, but you know they're, they're kind of boring. So just imagine a very flat line for like a thousand years and the second half of the 19th century, everything just changes. It just goes like this. Whether it's population or income or economic growth, uh, longevity, whatever statistic you want to look at, it's a hockey stick. Life is completely transformed. So what happened? That bred a reaction, a kind of conservative reaction. You can call it the left, you can call it the right, it doesn't matter. Socialism is a kind of conservatism, by the way. I don't know if you discovered this. They, they're always looking for the, the past age, how to restore something that they feel like they're lost. It's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's another form of conservatism. <clears throat> but the kind of reaction we experienced in the early part of the 20th century to the age of laissez-faire was dramatically transformative. We invented a thing that I think is rightly called the total state, meaning that a state that knows no limits to its power. It's not bound anymore by the Constitution. <clears throat> it can control every product that you consume, it can control. It has access to your bank account so it can pillage you whenever it wants. It can uh, demand that you have papers to pass a border so that you have to have a passport even to travel. It became a society of permission by the state. Everything. This wasn't even true. So by 1918, we had passports, we had income taxes, we had a central bank, uh, we had direct democracy, uh, we had all kinds of, and, and we had labor regulations. So you couldn't even make a deal to work without asking, without, uh, without the state intervening with uh, minimum wages and things like that. And I talked about this last year the origin of minimum wages. And, oh, and, and uh, if you're a woman uh, moving to a big city, there are special regulations on you, you know? In 1908, uh, New, York, New York City passed a rule that uh, women couldn't work uh, before 8 p.m. or, or uh, after 10 p.m. And that was because they wanted to protect women from, uh, from the wilds of the world <clears throat> and encourage them to uh, stay at home and have kids rather than rather than getting involved in commercial life. Um, 
There is a movement of women uh, that countered that. They said that uh, women should uh, operate under the same rules men do because you know the wages were higher if you worked at night. So that annoyed a lot of young women moving to the city. So they started a move new movement that uh, used the slogan, equal pay for work, equal work, right? So that was originally a slogan that applied to a free market movement, actually. Very interesting. Yeah. But it was a change in American life. The total state was born in reaction to the liberation, the emancipation that free markets brought to humanity in the second half of the 19th century. It was a kind of period of panic. All right. Now let's talk about the third great transformation that happened. A similar hockey stick pattern, flat, 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 suddenly it goes up it's through the roof. What I'm referring to is the age we live in right now. And it, start, it was born about 20 years ago. First, with the collapse of communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall, the opening up of Eastern Europe, <clears throat> liberation of billions of people around the world from tyranny, who suddenly became part of the global division of labor. And the reforms, God bless them, in China. We went from a society that characterized by <clears throat> famine and holocaust and mass death to one that's increasingly characterized by aspiration, economic freedom, and prosperity. So suddenly, over the, over the last 20, 25 years, we've seen billions of new people brought into the division of labor. And we've seen markets work again, creating what we call, sometimes called globalism, or really just the world economy, I think is a better way to put it. Meaning that we, we cooperate with millions of people around the world regardless of borders, every single day, for every single product. I mean, uh, from, from these chairs to your shoes, <clears throat> clothes on your back, the jewelry you're wearing, um, all your electronics, everything in your life nowadays comes from hundreds of different countries involving millions of people in production. <clears throat> and it's been a beautiful thing to see. If you were gonna look at the period after World War II and name one good thing that's happened to economic liberty since World War II, I would say the end of tariffs or the radical diminution of tariffs gradually through the decades and the rise of the global economy over the last 20, 25 years has been amazing because what it's done has led to a reduction in the power of the nation state. So it started to reverse that first wave of horror that happened in the late Middle Ages and give us something completely new, a, 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 a new way of interacting with humanity. And we've all kind of, we've kind of gotten used to it now, right? We buy our apps uh, that are made all over the world. You don't care where your apps on your phone our service to come from. Waze comes from Israel, you know, for example. <clears throat> you name it. Uh, we, technicians all over the world cooperate every day to making your life better. It's been a beautiful thing. So, I began to reflect on this, and I think it's very important to understand it, because I think some of us in this room have been very alarmed in recent days at the change in our political life like, I think in the old days, I mean like in the 80s, I could usually find some national political figure that I, yeah, I thought was mostly correct, you know, had the right ideas, kind of didn't agree with all of it, but agreed with a lot of it. That's ever less true for us. We're all trapped between these two forces, the left and the right, that are attacking us, plotting this attack on us every single day, whether it's the Green New Deal on one hand or or Trump's tariffs on the other. And this Trump stuff is actually extremely serious. This isn't, this isn't just like, well, I like Trump, he makes me laugh, he's funny, I don't agree with him on tariffs, it's not that big a deal. It's a big deal. Because the guy is seriously, seriously confused. Like, seriously confused. You can look at the trade deficit figures right now, and you know what a trade deficit is? It's just like phony baloney calculation that compares the difference between uh, you know, what we buy from China versus what China buy, uh, buys from us. It's actually of absolutely no relevance any more than if I had a trade deficit figure between what Louisman buys from me and what, what I buy from Louisman. It just doesn't matter. As long as there's a mutually beneficial exchange, it's good. It's a good thing. It's not a problem. But Trump doesn't understand that. 
So there's something like wrong with the guy, right? So, so he looks at trade deficit figures. What's the top country on uh, the trade deficit figure with the United States? It's of course China. And the figure is something like $340 billion. So he says, oh, China owes us $340 billion. So I, try to follow this. So I'm gonna put on tariffs amounting to $300 billion and make them pay us back. Wait, who's gonna pay those? Um, China. <coughs> Guess what? He doesn't have any authority to make China pay anything. You know who's paying the tariffs, right? It's you and me. It's crazy. It's a, so he's punishing, he's punishing Americans for this artifice called the trade deficit that was concocted by statisticians. And by the way, the number is itself phony because it's entirely dependent upon uh, country of origin statistics, which make no sense at all. I don't know if you know about how country of origin statistics works, but let's just imagine a situation where we decide here in this room to make a coffee cup for a pork fest. Pork fest, coffee cup. So Carla comes up with this really good idea for a uh, pork fest coffee mug. Uh, somebody else in the room uh, you know, designs it, and it's really beautiful. And you're like, okay, this is gonna be a good cup. Um, what do you think we could sell it for? I bet pork festers would pay $15 for this pork fest cup. Well, great. Um, <clears throat> well, where are we gonna get it made? Well, let's shop online. But here's a company, Four in Print. And they say they can make this cup for us for $4 each. Well, that, that's a pretty good profit. We'll make a little bit of money to fund this fun festival for everybody. Well, where is the 4 imprint going to get their cup made? In China, right? It's the only place you can really get affordable anything made, really, anymore. So you import it, you're selling it. Well, guess what? That mug, even though, oh, and you sell it to pork festers, right? So it was conceived in New Hampshire, designed in New Hampshire, sold to New Hampshireites, and paid for uh, the profits of these sales from New Hampshire, but because the final transformative event took place in China, it's listed as an import. Now I find that ridiculous. China is the country of origin for this coffee, coffee cup. This is the way the statistics work. That's what goes into creating the trade deficit, right? And it's all over the world. So Trump's looking at the trade deficits going, well, a lot of countries owe us money. Well, who else is on this list? You know who number two is? Mexico. That's why he's always threatening against tariffs against, uh, against Mexico. He's like, you know, those Mexicans, you know, they owe us a lot of money. Another, other people on the list, um, Malaysia, Malaysia, Canada, Canada, Germany, Ireland, <laughs> they all owe us money. I'm telling you, this is true, that he is so confused, he's got all of these people on a hit list. This list came out from the Treasury Department, I guess, in May. It's, it's, a, it's called a watch list. It should be called a hit list of all the countries that he thinks owes us money. We're gonna have tariffs against all these people. And it's literally trying to reverse this hockey stick of globalization. He thinks alone he can reverse this. Now this is basically a crazy man, right? It's extremely dangerous. You know, the Soviets would do this from time to time. They would sit around in the Central Committee and say, you know that, uh, that ocean over there? Why don't we, uh, why does it flow this way instead of that way? I don't know. Well, let's change that. This happened all the time. They're constantly trying to reverse the flows of the ocean, you know? This is Trump with world trade. He's literally trying to reverse it. And if he succeeds, it's gonna be, he'll never succeed. But just the attempt alone is potentially catastrophic for us. And here's the great irony to me about this. He, um, <laughs> you know, it's common in these circles to talk about how uh, government has unintended consequences. You know, you say one thing and there's opposite results. So his great thing is he's gonna make America great. This is not going to make America great. In fact, it's going to change everything. He could actually end up inspiring events that cause the US dollar to cease to be the world reserve currency. Because here's the thing that goes on in this world. If you're gonna be the world reserve currency, that comes, that's a power, but with that comes great responsibility. You know, with that comes the need to uphold the world trading system and service 
the world in the creation of a global market. Trump doesn't want to do that anymore. So now you've got people scrambling all over the world. How can we continue to improve our lives and have market exchange and uh, employ people and create great products and continue the digital revolution? How can we do this without using the US banking system and the US dollar, which has proven itself to be basically toxic? So all over the world today, you've got plotting and planning to figure out other ways to conduct business without involving the US. That's going on right now. The dollar has been teetering now for a while. It used to be something like 70% of global transactions, then it was 60%, and now it's down to something like 53%. It could probably drop as low as 40 or even 35%, but at some point, Something else is going to take its place. We don't know what it's going to be. Is it going to be the euro? It could be. Could be the yuan. You know, China's very powerful uh, currency. It could be. Uh, could be the new Facebook coin. Right? We don't know. Could be Bitcoin. I'd love it. Could be Dogecoin. That's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Global <laughs> global reserve coins, currency. It was invented as a troll coin, but it's still going. So that's great. These things are happening in our time. I think, in many ways, this is bad news for Americans, because we don't know what the effects of the end of the, uh, the de-dollarization of the world economy is going to be, because there's dollars flowing all over the world, they're all gonna be repatriated. What's that gonna do to the inflation rate? We don't know. The good part about it is it's probably gonna end up ending the US military empire. That's actually a good thing, because that's the source of America's military strength right now. That's a big transformation, <clears throat> and uh, it's all gonna happen, I think, within the next five years. So, you heard it, you heard it here. Um, and it's not, gonna be, it's not gonna be pretty, and it's not, it's not gonna succeed either. I think what we need to start thinking about today in this room is a little more longer term. We need to start thinking about the post-Trump world and what we want it to look like. And I don't think it looks like what the Republican Party looks like today, and I don't think it looks like the Democrats, and I haven't really hammered the Green New Deal, but this is an absurd position. You know, it's actually, I don't know what's more dangerous, Trump's trade policies or the Green New Deal. I mean, it depends on what day I wake up on. You know, you wake up with a nightmare, you know, it's like one, either the left or the right, you don't know, <laughs> on any particular day. They're both very, very scary. But neither are going to go anywhere. The idea that we're gonna abolish fossil fuels in the name of changing uh, the climate you know, 100 years from now strikes me just as absurd as the idea we're gonna end up in the global economy with, uh, with terrorists. These are wild, insane fantasies and they just can't last. So what is the world we wanna, wanna live in? Quite, put quite simply, we want a world in which the state plays as little role as possible in regular people's lives. Which is to say, societies that function on their own, where everybody has an opportunity for universal ennoblement and dignity and work, making money and keeping what you earn, and not having to ask permission for every damn thing you do. That's the world we want to live in. It's, it's, it's a beautiful philosophy. It was basically born about 500 years ago. It had a name, and that name was liberalism. I'm in favor of taking back that word, because it doesn't seem like anybody's really using it that much anymore. The progressives call themselves progressives. The fascists call themselves conservatives. I think we should just start calling ourselves liberals. We've got a job to do over the next five years and it's to convince our fellows and anybody who's willing to listen to us of this vision. That vision is a vision of <clears throat> universal prosperity and peace, ennoblement, dignity to every individual, rights, human rights for all people, and governments that don't interfere in the evolution of society and our lives in particular. That's it. Now, to me, now there are a lot of details to fill in on all that, and a lot of you here today are working on those details. 
But I think what we could, we could do, the best thing we can do is work on our language. Work on our language. I would describe it as a society of love. I don't think it's that complicated. It's a chance for all people to meet each other in all walks of life and exchange and find value in each other. That's really all we're working towards. It's not complicated. I think it's actually very beautiful. And if we can make sure that we describe our vision that way, a society of freedom and love, I think we're going to have the best chance for success. And let's not forget how much this really matters, how much it matters what you say, what you think, what you do, how you talk to other people. Because it's ideas, ultimately, that rule the world. If you doubt it, consider that five years ago, there wasn't a Republican alive who believed in mercantilist trade policy and protectionism and tariffs. It just didn't happen. Trump changed all of that. I remember when he first changed, uh, spoke in uh, uh, Freedom Fest in 2015, yeah, I was sitting there and he stood up in front of a Republican audience and he said, you know, we need, we need a lot of tariffs on China. And I thought, that's never gonna go anywhere. These people are way too smart for that. <laughs> And true, uh, people just kind of politely clapped a little bit. Now he fills up stadiums with the same damn message. Everybody's going, yeah, make America great through ta more taxes on Americans. That's great. So this goes on all the time. How did he do it? Through propaganda, but mainly through ideas, by changing the things that people believe about the world. It's the ideas people hold that construct the future. Everything around you is built of the ideas of the past. Everything we're going to build in the post-Trump era and that's, in, again, I think it's in five, six years, is going to be emerge out of the ideas that people come to believe over the next few years. And that's up to people like us. Educated, connected, you've got blogs, you've got uh, access, thank God for it. We can really make a difference in the world because we have the greatest weapon of all. And that weapon is good ideas backed with great language. But there's one final thing I want to mention. And that is, above all else, moral courage. The courage to push through the opposition and tell the truth regardless of the consequences, even at great personal risk and cost to you personally. This is something we're all going to be challenged to do. And I can just tell you this, my friends, it's much harder than you think. To make a difference requires not just one sacrifice, but three not just three, but maybe 30, maybe 300. It's hard, and you're gonna get a lot of pushback. We've gotta be ready for it. To be a libertarian is to be a person imbued with a mission and a passion, a dedication to that cause, and the willingness even to suffer uh, reputational damage, even uh, personal finance, uh, maybe damage to your person in the service of it. But you know what? It's worth it. Freedom is the source of life. It's why we're here. We were born to be free, not caged, not taxed, not bullied, not to ask permission for everything we do, but to behave freely, creatively, cooperatively with our neighbors, whoever they might be, in whatever way you choose. That's the society I want to live in. Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> got time. We got about ten minutes for questions. Yeah, we're going to meet perfect. on the main field for the group picture, and then David Freeman will be here in the pavilion after the group picture. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yes, sir. I have actually two questions. Number right. one, I am an employer. And the common lament of the trade deficit is that we're sending all our jobs overseas. Yeah. Now, if that's true, how come New Hampshire has the second lo lowest unemployment rate in the country at 2.4% or something like that? And that's question one. And the other question is, a couple of years ago, I was granted the U.S. patent on a new landscaping tool and I'm actually scared of success yeah. because I might just have to send over to China because 
Although uh, I can't find anybody to work as it is. Yeah, we have a huge labor shortage in this country. It's actually a huge, uh, big deal. Um, immigrants have basically stopped trying to come here. It's ter it's impossible if you ever try to get a foreign worker. Especially in the Northeast, there's a massive labor shortage, and people are withholding production for that for that very reason. And uh, it's it's getting scary. I mean, it's um, and I really want to get to the point with this immigration debate where it's not political anymore. Like basically, the reason the Republicans have turned against immigration is they think they're all going to vote for the Democrats. It's really not complicated. That's it. I don't think it's really racial. I think it's just purely political. They don't want they don't want uh, the country turning into California. The rest of the country turning into California, which means that they can reliably vote for the Democrats. I'm, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but this is their paranoia. This is what this is what the immigration debate is all about. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, oh, yeah, one other point about this trade deficit. You know, it only pertains to goods, not services. Well, 80 percent of production in this, in this economy today is, is services, and the end of the world in general. So this has absolutely nothing to do with anything. It's a it's a completely fake statistic that's possessed uh, the despot uh, dictator of the United States. Okay, go ahead. Hello, Jeffrey. Hello, nice. This is um, my mentor and friend, and, and um, you know, I, I think 99% of his message is so important, and I agree totally with it. And because I love him, I'm going to get in his ass about the 1%. Um, so I'm glad you brought up our ongoing conversation about child labor. And I actually want to put the word laws aside for a minute. All right, let's not talk about laws. Let's talk about child labor. So as, we, as we've discussed in um, you know, evenings at, at, at the house, um, there's two kinds of child labor. There's what I call tuckery in child labor, which is uh, I'm going off at age 12 to get my job and my paycheck, and I'm coming home with my paycheck. And there's what I call Dickensian child labor which maybe we don't like quite as much. Um, now, to zoom out a little bit and to the message, let's talk about love. Let's talk about lasting love, constructive love between two parties, right? I, I, neither of us are maybe that good at relationships, I don't know, but I've found that um, when I put somebody up on a pedestal and I think they can do no wrong, that that's not a sustainable relationship. And I wonder if we can't combine the love that you're talking about with a willingness to accept there are things that can happen in the market that we don't like. And that doesn't mean we have to make laws about them. That's the tragic fallacy of the nation state, that we even think that, that the only way to look at these problems through laws. If we don't like something about child labor, why don't we say, that could be a problem, and let's look for ways, voluntary, local, bottom-up ways, to, to address that as a society. I think that adds to the message rather than, um, rather than subtracting the Well, I think this is right, and Max, this is something you've taught me about, about the market in general. It's not, it's not a way to create a perfect society. What it is is it's a pathway to create a correctable society. It gives us the means to fix the problems we discover. Whereas you, usually with the state, they lock it down. Everything is glued down and nothing changes. I mean, we're still being oppressed by laws passed in 1917, the Espionage Act. I mean, for God's sake, you know? Whereas the market, the market does this creative destruction thing, right? It's always trying to find problems and it fixes them. That's what we want. We want an adaptive, evolving society, not a perfect society. You know, and it occurs to me too on this whole subject of child labor, I don't understand why, well I do understand why, but we believe that children have to choose between work and school. Like why do we think that? It's only because of schooling is compulsory and lasts all day and more and more lasts all year. And the kids don't have time to work. And so it doesn't, it, but, but in, a, in a world of a privatized, decentralized schooling, I could imagine that there would be a lot of new alternatives that would come along that would allow kids to have remunerative work and also get an education at the same time. But like, why do we think that the world has to just keep persisting in its current state? The only reason it does is because of the government. Otherwise, we would be extremely creative over education. That, that is a real source of frustration for me. That and the childcare markets, too. I mean, that's the most regulated industry in America, right? 
So Democrats are always complaining about this. Well, there's a huge shortage of child care. What should we do? Well, clearly we need government child care programs. What? Well, why don't we start with getting rid of the central Soviet-style central plan that's causing people to not be able to provide child care? That's a, that would be the best uh, possible start. Anyway, thank you, Max, for your comments. And I, I've learned, I think, a lot from you. And I'm sorry about my provocative comments about child labor. It was only because, this all began because one night at the house, I had uh, chimney uh, uh, Swiss in my chimney. And I came down, I said, does anybody know uh, like a 10-year-old uh, English child with a suit and a top hat we can bring in here to clean my chimney? <laughs> Go ahead. Something you said just resonated with me really well. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know, most people here probably don't know, but uh, all the firewood provided to the campground, to all the campsites, uh, that's all processed by a 13-year-old that was homeschooled. Wow. Yes. So Isn't that great? And that's, that's one of the things of exemption in child labor is that you can work for your family business. Exactly. So this, this, yeah. this, this kid is... is so yeah. anytime you find five with a big pile of five with over here, I love it. That comes to the child. Yeah. Who's making money here yeah. in school? Yeah. Well, go back to me. Yeah. That's great. Actually, you know, it's interesting to see how homeschooling has bred all kinds of new industries. And they got like soap making, for example, right? It's a huge industry. In fact, you know, there's a bill in Congress to basically make it illegal to make soap at home, you know? This is, this is the goal. Because it's a big, yeah, it's a big homeschooling thing that uh, you get together. Isn't that so beautiful and so wonderful? Who would have imagined that we'd have whole industries that are born out of the homeschool movement, all because a little exemption in the law that allows kids to work for family businesses, and that's it. You give a little bit of freedom, you can change the world. It's so we lovely. Have to close that <laughs> yeah, we have to close the loophole. That's exactly it. They're homeschooled, how can they sell cigarettes? <laughs> Yeah, I got my son involved in the business very early. Please, you know, use me as a great example here, but stay out of jail, stay out of jail. All right, well, thank you so much, Park Fest, for inviting me. Look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Always, always a, a great uh, honor to hear you speak. Um, so. Uh, I, I love I love uh, Jeffrey's speeches about entrepreneurship. That, those are great. And so we are meeting. Um, We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire, with the Free Staters.